our third speaker for this morning's session is Eric Larson, a man after my own heart, in other words, a musician. He's the owner of a company called Sonic Age. He's from Ashland, Oregon. He's an engineer, a musician, and an inventor. His main invention that he's going to be talking about today is the Cymoscope. He plays guitar, Hammond organ, sings, does a lot of uh, festivals up around his region. Um, he's setting things up so bands can play through water and have things projected behind them. Uh, he's uh, very deep into the science of sound and cymatics. So this should be uh, a pretty fascinating lecture. Let's welcome Eric Larson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I've been watching the Tesla Tech and, and uh, Tesla Society for many years, and uh, we share many passions. Uh, my passion is sound, and my company is Sonic Age. Uh, this is a video of uh, the sound of the stars. This is a, we just started an uh, exhibition at the Smithsonian Institute. Do we have audio with that? These are pieces that we, they, uh, they recorded the sound, uh, the resonance of stars, gave them to us. We ran it through the cymoscope, and these, video, these first couple videos are what you see when you play the sound of stars through the cymoscope. I'm putting all the videos out front so you get a feel for what it is we're talking about. Look at the human voice. Now that's sound in water. If we go on to the next one. sound you're hearing is actually creating those images in the scope. That's about a one inch cup of water, a thin, uh, uh, shallow, egg-shaped cup of water that's coupled to a transducer and actually being moved with the sound that they gave us that they recorded from the stars. The exhibition the Smithsonian just opened uh, the last couple weeks. This is 60 cycles per second run through the cymoscope and the shape that it makes. And I look for uh, the nature of the shape that it creates. So the coherence of the shape, the coherence of the geometry, how it moves, how it flows. Um, after this stops, you'll see it goes silent a second. And the next uh, frequency that will come through is 50 cycles per second. I had people asking me, uh, is there any way to make what's coming through the electric socket uh, more healthy? And looking at the reasons why we have 60 cycles per second. Now this is 50 cycles per second. You can notice more coherency, more geometry. It's in a fixed system with the, with the last. So it's a very unique way at looking at resonance. Why don't we go on to the next one, please? So a lot of these videos are from our old cameras, and we've just moved up to all full HD. You'll see some stuff today that's full uh, HD. This is when I put uh, an indicator. This is I put kids' glitter in the water. So if you can watch here. How the glitter is suspended by the sound in the water and how the, the formation, if you think about the universe, if you think about nature, we'll go into how nature is, uh, we as, as humans are sort of structured together. This is what happens when you turn the sound off. I don't know if we can turn the hiss off. Is that coming through? The, yeah, there you go. That's better. 
we run the next one, please? This is a, a one inch cup of water with another ring around it or a moat around the water. So when you see this one play, uh, you take a look at the shapes that get generated and really uh, I'm interested in the shape of sound and, and what it looks like and how we can, and also the spin and the vortation of sound. So you see the outer ring, I'm actually controlling with the amplitude and I can stop it, I can spin it right, I can spin it left, really controlling the images and controlling cymatics and turning cymatics into a science is the focus of uh, Sonic Age. And so being able to really dial it in so that we can uh, make it do what we want and understand why it does what it does is very important to us. Why don't we move on to the next one, please? I do presentations sometimes and I'll talk about the history of cymatics and this and that and 15, 20 minutes into it people are like, what is this stuff? So I like to get it all, I like to show it to you first. Can we make that not stretched in and all? That should be round. This is from the new HD cameras. Um, and this is a sine wave, an analog sine wave played into the water. And I'm playing with the amplitude. So I'm turning it all the way down. I shoot through a light ring. So when you see all black in the middle and just the lights around the outside, my camera is shooting through a light ring. And the light is actually tracing the resonant topology of the water is holding uh, with the sound in the water. Why don't we move on to the next one, please? My favorite band, Elephant Revival, played through the water. So we're here to talk about cymatics and uh, cymatics uh, 
was a, a, a formed by a Greek word called kaima, and uh, it, it is basically the, the science of sound and wave phenomena. Uh, the microscope uh, opened up new realms of seeing into the microscopic, where the telescope did the same for uh, seeing the rest of the universe. And being able to bring it into our consciousness, being able to see what's very small, what's being very large, has really uh, opened up the thought pattern. And uh, I think cymatics and the cymoscope is the next instrument that you'll be able to look at sound. And uh, when we do cymatics, we get a, a very visual impression of what each, each resonance looks like, or what our own voice looks like, what different sounds look like. Uh, we're the first ones since, uh, the first ones really to provide a commercially available cymatic device. And the cymoscope is really uh, an instrument that tunes a, a latex membrane very accurately. I do sand and, and solid matter on the latex membrane, and then I do water in a water drive module on top of that. So the, the cymoscope does both sand and water cymatics. The piece on the top is where the water goes, and the sand goes on a membrane down underneath here. When Hans Yeni first did cymatics, he never really told us what the tension on the membrane. Cymatics has to do with the, 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 the sound, the volume of that sound, the amplitude, and the tension on that membrane. So you can make easy, simple cymatic devices by taking a balloon and stretching it over something that you can blow through and put sand on top of it, and you can move the sound. But if you don't have the membrane tuned, like the string of a guitar, uh, it's very difficult to make a science out of cymatics because you always get different shapes. You really have to have a fixed system. So this, the cymoscope uh, is our effort to uh, make a very stable system that we can get the same results off of every time. This, this is a picture of sound and water. When you zoom into these pictures of sound and water, uh, it's amazing what we see. The, uh, it looks like human forms. It looks like beings coming through. It looks like we, we've seen opening the window to what we've seen in the lab. And a lot of the cymatics that I did for the first five years, been doing it since 2005, was in the, in the viewfinder of a camera. And with the new equipment we have now, we're able to put it HD on big screens and really zoom in and see the fine details. So what you're looking at is a resonant topology, is the shape, of the, the shape that the water takes this is the water drive module here uh, and the camera above. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to see with this projector. Um, but uh, we, we, I shoot with a camera through a light ring into a cup of water. It's basically what this is. And the light is actually tracing that topology. So the images you see are light indicating the shape of the effect of sound on the water or on any matter we put in there. The devices, I've learned a lot through cymatics and doing the, doing the uh, device development. I never knew about the phi proportion. I went through art school, I went through engineering school, and I was never really told that there was a proportion that was relative to everything in nature, our bodies and leaves and shells. And so phi proportion, 1 to 1.618, I used to design all the devices. And you'll see the, the phi proportion. You see that the scope itself is laid out to that. Our bodies are laid out to that, flowers. You see the daisy. And to the right is the cymatic image created that looks like that. So everything in nature is actually structured by the resonance of the universe, the resonance of your environment, the resonance of your thoughts, the resonance of uh, those around you. This might be hard to see, too hard to see. I design all the cups in the phi proportion. Uh, low frequency stuff I look at in a larger cup, about an inch, and as I go higher in frequency, I go down in the size of the cup. So very high frequency I'll look at in a cup that's not an eighth of an inch wide. The image you see on the left is actually high frequency uh, fractalating into a tile that looks like, it'll look like, uh, fish scales, it'll look like uh, many things in nature. And in order for me to get a single glyph, like you'll see some of them are more like a mandala, a, sim a single glyph, I've calculated the size of the cups in the phi proportion and uh, studied 
what size I need to be at. It takes a lot of sound energy to move water. More examples of, of cymatics in nature. This, this image up here is one of Alexander Ladovasser's uh, images from his book. Uh, and he's a researcher in Europe that's a, a real pioneer in, in cymatics. And down here you see one of our images uh, of ancient beings that we can, we can actually uh, look for what resonance has created what shapes of, of different creatures. Our company is Sonic Age. And John Stuart Reed is my business partner. John and I are the co-inventors of the Cymoscope. I was introduced to John in 2005. And uh, he's an acoustics engineer and did a lot of experiments in the Great Pyramids. I'll show you a little bit of that. And Annalise Reed and Vera Gadman uh, have been with us all this time as well and help us, help us build a company. They're writing books on cymatics and children's books on cymatics to try to get at an educational level some basic understanding of resonance and the structure of resonance. John lives in England and uh, John and I were both developing cymatic devices and at one point we got stuck together and decided that it would be best if we if we did it together. So we've had a very nice relationship over the last seven years doing this. John uh, what really spiked my interest was a book that John did called Egyptian Sonics. And John went into the Great Pyramid, and he'd been studying uh, not only how the pyramids were made, how they cut the stone, uh, but the resonance of the pyramid itself. He went into the, the Great Pyramid at Giza, and he measured the dominant resonant frequency of the king's chamber and the sarcophagus by ringing them up with a, a glissando of sound. So basically going up through the sounds and watching on a spectrum analyzer where the peak was. Um, you've seen a woman sing and break a glass with her voice. When, when the voice hits the resonant frequency of that glass, it literally shatters it. So the, uh, the Great Pyramids are completely lined with granite that came from very far away. For some reason, they dragged high, quartet, high quartz content granite. Uh, and lined, the, the sarcophagus is made out of it, the king's chamber is made out of it, and uh, the entranceways and all the hallways are lined with granite. And what John did was he made a cymatic device out of the king's chamber. So he rebuilt the, the broken corner with foam, and he took a plastic membrane, and he stretched it over the whole sarcophagus, and he ran the resonant frequencies that he recorded back through it and uh, he had paid the antiquities inspector to go in and do this research and they had Egyptian uh, help, aides to help them bring this stuff in and out and they were basically like, when, when is this, uh, this Englishman going to be done with this experiment? What's this all about? As soon as he hit it with the dominant resonant frequency, the protector symbol came out in the sand. He put the sand from in there on the, on the membrane. Uh, the eye of Seva, the Ankh, the protector symbol was the first thing to come up. All of a sudden, they're really interested in that. So John's book, uh, Egyptian Sonics, he's photographed hieroglyphs coming off of the, uh, the sarcophagus itself, using the, sarcoph the sarcophagus as a cymoscope. Sound, we've been, we've been talked into the sound wave. We've been talked into the sine wave. And just like in physics and in mathematics and a lot of our sciences, we were realizing that a lot of the things that we were taught in school and college, uh, we're rethinking now. In, in nature, there are no straight lines. There are no circles. There's nothing like a sine wave that has a perfectly straight line with one arc that comes up, and this goes perfectly underneath, and this comes up. And every nature works on pulse, and uh, nature works on peristalsis. So when you, if we think of sound as a mathematical wave, uh, when we speak, we actually emit an electromagnetic bubble. Uh, and through that bubble is a cross section of is the cymatic image. So when we look at a lot of these cymatic images, I'm actually passing the bubble of sound through a membrane and putting an indicator on that membrane. So I'm drawing a shape that looks kind of like a, a crop circle that, that in the sand, the sound is being moved to the silence. And in the water, it's showing you right where the vibration is. I 
use the phi proportion, I use biogeometry, I use vortex-based mathematics, and uh, I build devices uh, not only off the images that I get off the scope, but I, I build everything nodally uh, to resonant geometry. Uh, this is a flow form on the right for uh, healing water. I built guitars for eight or nine years, built guitar factories. I'm a tool maker and uh, solar rigs. I moved out here to uh, the West Coast to work at a company building inflatable solar rigs you see on the left. I've worked with Patrick Flanagan uh, doing his sensors. I do SolidWorks 3D modeling and, and help inventors take their idea out of the computer and put it in their hands basically, do rapid prototyping and such. And rodent coils. Uh, a year ago, Marco Roden came through Ashland with a couple of his engineers and they've stayed with us there and we're working uh, with a group called Thrival Tech and uh, we're building new technology out of uh, resonance and sound and uh, <clears throat> the rodent coils. Uh, we're hitting with resonant commutations. <clears throat> I don't like to say frequency because again, there's not individual sing single frequencies in nature. And mathematics, you can pick out numbers from mathematics and it, you can do a lot of things to make numbers stand out. But what I'm really looking at is the resonant structure that includes, uh, think of it more as chords, as commutations. And the commutation or the chords that you play into something like a coil if you, if you want to do efficiency. Uh, Tesla said if you want to understand the universe, you have to understand vibration and resonance. You have to, without, because it is really what's structuring the universe. Um, putting individual digital sine waves into a coil only does so much. But when you put not only chords, but the right chords, it's not so much about the individual frequencies. It's about the space between those frequencies and the amplitude of each of those frequencies that makes a commutation or a chord that creates efficiency, that creates uh, power. The, the nature of the, the presentation is the power of sound. How do we use sound, how do we use resonance uh, to pull energy from the field? How do we use sound and resonance to uh, understand what is healthy for us, what's not healthy? How do we bring ourselves back to health? Edgar Cayce said years ago that sound and water would be the next medicine, and I believe that very much. Uh, a lot of the devices, that's a six speaker scope up there that we're using to mix Manners commutations, Peter Guy Manners commutations, six frequencies at a time where I could look at each individual frequency in a cup and then I could look at the summation of all those frequencies and look for when I had coherent geometries, when they were all basically working together. Um, in order to do this, I need a fixed system. I need to know that my cups are the same size, I have exactly the same water, my temperatures are the same. Um, we're really trying to bring science to something that uh, is a very wobbly thing. You can make a lot of different pretty shapes, uh, but if you don't have a system that's locked down to do it, it you're not going to turn it into a science. Really, I'm a tool maker, so my passion is the machine tools and making injection molds and making the tooling. Uh, what we really want to do is get these devices out into the hands of people, get them into schools. We're working on kids' toys and a computer peripheral that you can run the sound from your computer right into a scope and take pictures of your own voice, your instrument, and such. All the devices are laid out uh, to the phi proportion, to geometric proportion. And the cymatics has really opened up for me uh, the world of geometry and understanding the, the resonance of geometries. And if we want to make devices, anybody here building devices, uh, building energy devices, building healing devices, if, if you design your devices to natural proportion, it then resonates with the environment. If you design things with straight lines and squares and a lot of our mechanical things that we've, that we've d designed over the years, uh, were not designed with what is the sound of, the, how does the sound of that engine lathe that I stood at for years, uh, grinding basically, you know, cutting with a, with a, a tool bit against a piece of steel and chattering, uh, I hung out in machine shops. My dad owned factories. I started at 12 years old in machine shops and uh, moved to Precision Valley in Vermont and worked with the American Precision Museum there and looked at the effects of uh, what are, it was where the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution in the United States, first place they made interchangeable parts. Um, and I was there in the mid 
2000s, early 2000s, when all, our whole industry was being thrown away, basically. They were, they were uh, the gear shaper, the uh, Jones and Lamson Lays, Bryant Grinder, Comb Blanchard, all the big, the, the machine tool companies that we'd built here uh, were all going away, basically. And the people that were left behind uh, in Springfield, Vermont, where I lived, were miserable. And I wondered why. <laughs> You know, and really, it wasn't just that they lost their jobs, but they'd been working in a very, very unhealthy environment. They'd been working in a building that had rebar and concrete underneath them. They'd been working in 550 power. They'd been working under mercury halide lamps. Um, and they'd been, you hold it, you touch the machine tool to feel how it's cutting. And so they were literally coupled to a, a, a mechanical uh, vibration, really a noise. And there's a big difference between noise and sound. The natural sounds that we make and the uh, uh, electromechanical noise and chatter that we expose ourselves to, EMF chatter, um, it's time to start to think about how those things affect our health. And the cymoscope uh, is a way to look at it. This is John Reed. And uh, John and I are good friends. And we go back and forth a lot. And uh, it's really nice to have somebody else. We never, we never really agree with each other. And it's what pushes the devices further, you know? Um, and, and when we do agree with each other, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, the, the devices and the science, our, our, our website is cymoscope.com. I'll have all that at the end. Uh, and John and Annalise and Vera have really done a beautiful job at putting all of this on the web. Uh, and I'll show you some of the interesting projects we've done with that. The Smithsonian project uh, with the sound of the stars is the most recent. John is working with Jack Kasowitz, the leading dolphin researcher in the, in the world, and imaging dolphin language. And a little hard to see again here, but what, what we have is they, they've taken the sound of the dolphin and they put this, uh, basically a flower pot, in the water and they had the dolphin make sounds and they recorded it with the flower pot in between in the interference pattern like that. And when we play the sounds back on the cymoscope, you can actually see the shapes of what's in the water. So the, the, the dolphin are actually uh, able to, you know, with sonar, we, we do that, but the animals and the dolphins are doing it. It's very interesting, the work. There's a lot of it on the website uh, about how to look at animal language. Also, uh, these are all the notes of the piano here, imaged. And Music Made Visible is our, uh, is our logo that we're bringing forward to do this professionally live and to actually build a cymatic recording studio where bands can come in with a multi-track of their new music and we image the guitar track and we image the drums and we image the voice and then you can take HD video back and composite that and actually make uh, music videos that's connecting people to uh, another, uh, another realm of music that they haven't been able to see before. I know as a musician and as a, a music lover, I've always sort of visualized in my head or used other audio visualization tools to sort of to look at that. You might have seen in a computer how you can set a piece of software to sort of thump along to the music that you're doing. Um, one of the issues as a musician of sending sound to the screen behind you is whenever I went into a computer, there was always a one to three second delay of the sound going in to the sound going out. So as a guitar player, if I pluck my string, uh, three seconds later the image would change. The beauty of the cymoscope is that the HD camera directly over the water goes right to the projector. So there's no computer in the way, no processing or anything. As soon as I hit the note, I'm, I'm changing the, the geometry behind me. A little bit of history, uh, for years, Leonardo da Vinci actually recognized cymatics by tapping on a, on a box and the sand in the bottom of the box. He wrote in his notebooks about the shape of the, the sand in the bottom. Ernst Clodney was a gentleman that invented Clodney plates, where you take a, uh, a plate and you stroke it with a bow. Now we use an oscillator underneath the plate to get different shapes, but the forms the modal shapes of the, the sand here, as on the, uh, the rubber membrane, is moving to the silence. So the, the black area that you see is the plate itself, that's where the sound is. And it's pushing the sand to the silence. We make a cyma plate that we sell on the, on the website. It's a very simple way, a whole kit 
for doing cymatics that way. And you can sit there and play with it all day. And wherever you stroke the plate, um, it's, it's about the distance from the edge of the plate to the center of the plate. If I, that distance there is going to make one note, but if I stroke the plate over here and I have another distance, it makes all different sounds as you go down the plate. And every different sound makes an amazingly different shape in real time as you see it. Napoleon Bonaparte actually offered a prize to anybody that could explain why sound made shapes like that. And this woman in the 1800s, uh, Sophie Germain, uh, won the prize for that. So it's been, it's been recognized for some time. Hans Yeni is really the pioneer of cymatics in the 50s and 60s. And in 2005, my friend Steve Fox that, that came to our Inventors Network handed me Yeni's big double volume book. And uh, I couldn't put it down. I, just, I was just totally taken by the fact that, that he was able to actually do all these experiments and come up with all these different shapes. These are the vowel sounds to the right. Uh, a, O, and E. And this is liquid on the top and sand on the bottom. So you can see the sand is sort of showing you one and the liquid is showing, uh, I, like to, I like to call it the, uh, the sand shows you the, the bones or the fingerprint of the sound and the liquid shows you sort of the flesh of the sound. He, he did a lot of experiments in, in smoke and uh, glycerin Lycopodium like powder is a spore, a, cl a club moss spore that's very small, very light, and very round, so it's very easy to move with sand. And if you see some of his early videos, they're really amazing. Uh, what, what's up on the top there is uh, metal filings moving along uh, under the influence of sound. This is a guitar where there's a speaker inside the guitar, it's putting frequencies, it sounds into the guitar, and you can actually see the how the top of the guitar is affected. This always interested me in, in guitar design to actually get, design guitars uh, to sound a certain way. Once you understand the geometry and the resonance and the relationship between shape and sound, you can start to design with it. And that's really what I'm doing now is, is I design the, the, the devices with the five proportion to make natural shapes. Now I take the natural shapes and I roll them back over into new devices. So just like in the, in the machine world, when the, the gears got better, the, uh, the lathes got better, the, the, the lathes got better, the grinders got better, it kept going around and around and the, and the technology evolved from that. These are friends of mine. This is Steve Fox, the man that introduced me to cymatics and uh, friends of mine back east that helped me a lot. I had a lot of help in this. You know, I always, it was, it's always been something that uh, captured people's attention. I've had a lot of uh, gear and equipment given to me and, and uh, over the years, this was the first actual device that I was able to get shaped. I went about a year without really being able to make a shape or anything that Yenny did. Uh, very frustrating to go. Uh, I tried all kinds of shapes from colanders and pots and, and uh, that expanded all these different shapes. The lab expanded. The lab kept getting bigger. Uh, today, the whole lab is boiled down into a rack mount and the whole rig is boiled down into, that's a one, one camera, one cup. Now we're doing three cameras, three cups, so I can look at uh, a full spectrum. We're opening up the spectrum now of what we can see. Trying to look at a whole resonant structure, especially music that has drums and bass, uh, you wind up tuning it so you can see the bass very well, but you lose all the highs. So we're just about to, to break that open. We're just about to do a Kickstarter to build a big road touring system uh, to do behind bands. This was the first successful uh, geometry in the sand I was able to create with my voice. This is sand on the membrane of the cymoscope. If I stretch the rubber membrane, um, if I wasn't able to perfectly tension that membrane, the shape itself would stretch. So the cymoscope really just holds a an, uh, about a 13 inch membrane perfectly radially and tunes it to, to be able to create images like this. And over and over again, the sand, you'll get different shapes of sound. I do, a lot of, I do a lot of recording people's voices, doing what we call a harmonic voice signature. Uh, some people will send me a recording of their voice. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed in the research in doing this is when I sit with somebody and 
I go directly into the scope with a good quality microphone, I get much better, much easier to make cymatic images with that. When I digitally record somebody's voice and they send me a digital recording of it and I, and I look at that in the scope, I got to turn it way up, I got I to gotta really tweak it to get uh, an effective cymoglyph out of it. And so I guess the biggest lesson in this is that uh, we are so much water and we are so more on the natural, you know, we're so, uh, our bodies are naturally structured water and resonance. And the music that we've been sold lately uh, in digital music and MP3s, they, they just assumed in order to get the file small, uh, we're gonna, we, people can't hear underneath 20 cycles and every, everything abo above and below what they figured you couldn't hear, they figured you didn't need. Uh, the healthy aspects, the structuring aspects of sound uh, are in the infrasonics. And, and if you don't have the infrasonic, if you don't have that, uh, the rumble to kick things up, I can put a small mountain of sand on the middle of the cymoscope and I can hit it with 250 cycles really loud all day and it won't go anywhere. Um, it'll stay right there in the membrane. If I put a digital sound, I can turn it up and turn it up, nothing, nothing happens, you know. Um, if I take a sound, and in relation to energy generation, if I take 100 cycles and then I take another 99.997 uh, cycles and I offset them just a little bit like that, the energy that's created by them trying to resolve each other again um, spreads, the, spreads the sand all over the membrane and allows the, uh, the sounds to take shape in the sand. People ask me all the time, one of the most common questions I have, can you prove that rap and heavy metal music are bad with the cymoscope? Every, you know, every presentation I gave, people were asking. And sound really, um, if you think of it like you need, a, you need an even sound diet. So if you don't have the some thump, 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 if you have a modern stereo that you just went to Walmart and bought for $200, um, it's not going to put out any bottom end. It's really not going to give you quality sound. They put the cheapest components in that thing so they can give you a radio and a CD player and a, you know, a lots of buttons and controls. Um, there's nothing like a tube amplifier. There's nothing like a record. It was amazing what we actually captured on records. For years, they didn't know all the information that they captured on records because the playback devices weren't, speakers and amplifiers weren't capable of playing it back. And that's really what we're looking at here in the sound too. What we're recording uh, in HD, and I really wish we had an HD projector so you could really see inside this thing. Um, we still don't, we're st still unable to really fathom all the stuff that we're, we're capturing. So these are all different people's voice imprints that we've done over the years. And your voice imprint uh, is as unique as you are. So really, in, in the future of encryption, the future of security and things, where, where now they might look at your retina, they might look at your fingerprint, uh, the information that's in your voice, and it's fractalating. So uh, every, every image that you get has every aspect of your voice imprinted in it. And uh, we've really learned a lot at looking at it, not only our own voices, uh, but the voices of, we've had a lot of, uh, the cymoscopes opened a lot of doors for us to scientists and to technology, but mostly to some really creative uh, and potent healers and singers and such that come through and, and image their stuff with us. We, uh, we sell artwork on the site. We print to, you know, we print on t-shirts and stuff and we print to canvas with that. Uh, on the site, you're going to see a lot of articles on sound healing, how, how sound affects the human body. And for years, um, I've been working on better applicators and better machines for delivering sound to the human body. And learning what we've learned about the difference between digital and analog, Peter Guy Manners, who came up with the Manners commutations, his, his adamant thing was always keep it analog. And the, and the machines, other machines got developed with frequencies. If you look at rife frequency stuff, there's a lot of people out there uh, thinking that rife frequencies are audio frequencies and playing rife sounds through a computer digitally at themselves through a speaker. Um, and with the manners commutations as well, uh, you really need to understand with the work that everybody's involved in here, uh, 
it's really important that we understand the effects of that on us, you know. I, I expose myself to all kinds of stuff in my labs. You know, people come in with different sounds and this and that and spend hours and hours just uh, staring into the water at the effect of this. And I'll, I'll go to sleep some nights for, for two days, I'll close my eyes, and I can't get 25 cycles out of my, my head, you know. It really does have an impact uh, and an effect on our health. The, uh, the best way we found to get sound into the human body is through water. Uh, worked with a gentleman named Gary Buchanan in Reno, Nevada, and we, we did a book uh, called Sauna. I, I, I collaborated, did all the cymatics in his book, Sauna. And uh, Gary was using the manners commutations, tweaking those commutations, treating people in hot tubs, and uh, able to speed up, uh, in particular, bone and tissue healing uh, very much in the water. Um, there's a lot of people that put tactile transducers and speakers onto the bottom of massage tables and put you on the top of that and put 150 watts into tactile transducers and basically vibrate the hell out of you. Um, all, of our, all of our transducers uh, are pretty stupid, are pretty dumb. They're, ver they're linear. We have a coil and we have a, a, a magnet and we're listening to music that really has this beautiful shape inside it, that's really propagating our, out of our mouths in this electromagnetic bubble and traveling in every direction. When somebody's walking behind you, 100 feet behind you, and you say something, they can still hear you because this bubble that we emit, this toroid really, uh, is, is emitting out in every direction, including back that way at the same time. Uh, in the Cymatics is really, when I use this egg-shaped cup that I use, I, I started doing it in vessels with straight walls on the side. So, like I was using the top of a, a film canister. And I remember in the early days of it, I still had the numbers on the bottom of the film canister, and I'd have to edit out the numbers on the bottom of it. When I did that, the, the, the water would go, it would bounce off the sides and come right back. And I didn't get very interesting pictures at all. Uh, as soon as I started using curves and getting away from the straight lines, once I started learning what I did about the phi proportion, once I started learning what I did about Victor Schauberger, uh, Victor Schauberger's work is totally amazing with, with what he did. Um, and he really understood field and flow and resonance, and uh, I've, I've coupled a lot of that into what we're doing. When I put it in an egg-shaped cup, what it does is it... it as it, it makes a toroid, it rolls the water back down under. If I turn it up really loud, it'll make a bubble come right up the top uh, and actually come up on my camera lens, you know, if I go too loud with it. Um, so I'm creating a toroid. These images that you see are actually a cross section of the toroid. And I can play with the focal planes of my camera and literally go down and look at uh, how the geometry changes down through the whole toroidal structure. And the same thing in the, in the uh, the hot tub. This is an inflatable hot tub. This is a 350 watt tactile transducer coupled to a, a, a 13 inch disc that pumps the bottom of the, the inflatable hot tub. There's eight tactile transducers around the outside of the hot tub in between the inflatable and the outer shell. And what this does is it takes a very mechanical linear thing and it puts it through an air chamber and it puts it into the water. So uh, it breaks up the linearity and the, uh, the really detrimental, unhealthy aspect of putting anything, whether it's a machine tool or a speaker or the resonance of your car. You'll notice if you, if you took the really comfortable seat out of your car and put it in your front yard and read a book through for three hours, you'd feel completely different than you do after driving the car for three hours. And uh, our automobiles and uh, everything around us what wasn't exactly designed with your health relative to the resonance that thing puts off in mind. When we injection mold a plastic cup or a plastic bottle like that, nature sees that as cancer. That doesn't resonate with nature. Uh, when, when nature sees something, here's, here's 200 thousands of these things, all the same shape. It really isn't uh, uh, biologically in the loop of it's not designed like nature. You know, we still don't really understand photosynthesis. We really don't still understand gravity. Uh, gravity. We really don't still understand what we've called electromagnetism. Um, and I think that 
through cymatic research, it gives us a window into understanding not only the nonlinearity of it, um, the asymmetrical nature of it. When I go through different, uh, uh, the, the, the rest of this really is different images, cymatic images. And, and I like to just keep talking and play through it. This is uh, an image that came off the violin. These are different images up from the violin. Now, I can play, uh, if I play a sine wave into the water, that's this mode of it. Then it goes back to here. As, as a, right now, and actually through working with Marco Roden's team and working with Thrival Tech, I've learned uh, much more about data acquisition and much more about using Arduino and much more about color, light, and sound. And uh, we're actually making a new system now where I can couple up the speed of my camera to the speed of my oscillators to I can record uh, where I was in that modal uh, section. I, I'm now able to control the temperature of everything. If you're going to study uh, the effects of resonance on the human body, it, on, the, on the kidney, for example, you have to do it in something at, at body temperature with the same osmolar weight as the body. Um, it's, it's very difficult to make assumptions that this shape is healthy, that, this, that the sound is healthy relative to a shape without really knowing much more about that because the shapes can be very different. That's the same violin going through different modes. There the water's down, here the water's up, here it's halfway in between. When I can really couple up the camera stuff, the new cameras are absolutely amazing. My, my, uh, my whole experience with cymatics for five years was in a viewfinder like this and onto a flash card and I'd have to wait you know, a slow flash card at that. And I've always shot at the highest resolution I can. When you really zoom in, these images are 5,000 pixels wide raw. And when you can really zoom in uh, and see the nature of what's going on, uh, I was unable to do that with the, with the original cameras. And the time it took me to take the picture, to do, I used to take 300 pictures to get five good pictures. And now we're up in the 80, 90% uh, percentile of high-res images, especially in the video. The video stuff, the initial stuff that you saw, um, I couldn't still, I couldn't save the stills and have them be high-res images, but now with the new stuff, uh, we, can, we can literally dissect every mode of the, of the experience. These are all from the violin. Uh, I did some research with folks that were into imaging the dominant brainwave frequencies, alpha, beta, theta, delta, gamma, like that. And we ran a lot of uh, analog uh, dominant brainwave frequencies through. And these are the images that we got. It's 28 cycles, 19 cycles. And, and I always look for... Uh, because I'm into science and I'm into spirituality, I'm into, I'm into geometry, uh, when, when the very potent symbols like a, knight, like a Knights Templar cross show up, when I see pyramid shapes, when I see uh, octagons and dohecahedrons and I look at the, the nature of uh, domes that they design for sound uh, in the eight shape, uh, that's really what I learned from the cymatics is, is what, what uh, the resonance of different geometries, because geometries, the, ge the geometric structure itself uh, is not only what's supporting that, not only what's supporting our body to hold this shape, um, but it's telling us something. There's more information inside these things that tell us uh, about the design of, of what we're looking at. That's nine cycles per second. I remember thinking, uh, looking down through the brain, you know, a lot of these look like, I, I think as I did these, uh, if you're actually looking down through the resonance of the brain with it, I did a series probably three, four years ago of a lot of the popular uh, classical music, ran a lot of classical music through the scope. So these are all images from uh, different pieces of classical music. Now these are snapshots of one, one moment in that music. And three, four years ago, it was so difficult to image music at all that I'd, I'd literally run the whole piece of music through and again, search through a whole lot of uh, not very good looking cymatics to get 
the couple images in there that came out. But the, the device development and the systems that we're using now are giving us much more control to uh, capture uh, the full excursion of, of the sound and the music. I did imaging of tuning forks uh, for Randy Masters, for Fabian Maman, uh, and looking at the shape that the tuning forks made in the, in the sand. And what I noticed was that that there was really a shape of the full excursion of that tuning fork. When you take a video of the moment you strike it and as it's going through its excursion and as it peters off, uh, it's not really a matter of one picture to say this sound or this song is this one shape, but really you want to look at the full excursion of how, uh, of how sound is affected and how sound is uh, absorbed and what happens to sound when we speak it? One of the biggest things that I've learned about sound is if, if my voice is an electromagnetic bubble, that when I speak at you, this thing goes and, and you literally absorb that. Uh, if I speak at the wall, it's going into the wall. If I speak up into the sky, it's literally continuing on into the sonic weave that's in our atmosphere and in our universe all around. And it's blending into a, into a, uh, a coherent resonant structure. Um, but if you're saying things that are out of coherence, if you're doing things, resonance really, you can think of it as thought. You can think of it as, in, as intent. You, when you look at Matsuro Emoto's work um, and what he's doing with water and intent, uh, I realize a lot that what I'm doing, when I'm doing testing of wa a water sample, because I can put a water sample in and I can add salt to it, I can, I can, I can change the water sample and change the, the geometry. So I'm actually able to measure the change in water uh, right in the fixed system. Uh, when I speak, I think differently about what I say. It makes me think, knowing the science of what's going on, uh, makes me really think before I say something, to, before I have intent, even the thoughts. Uh, studying meditation, studying spirituality, studying Buddhism, studying Hinduism, g gave me the idea that what I was saying and what I was doing impacted the whole universe. But seeing it uh, and actually experiencing it that way was what r really made it sink in. Five minutes, oh, I could go on all day. All right. So it really made me think about uh, what I did, what I said, what I thought. Um, and as we develop these devices, uh, with the rodent coil stuff that we're doing, I'm very interested in what's happening in that flux field in the middle. I'm very interested in that nozzle. I, I'd like to make uh, a scope for what we call electromagnetism. Because if we want to design things that have more efficiency and more torque and uh, pull from the field, uh, we need to design things around the resonant equilibrium. Uh, we're designing things very energetically, not synergetically. So we have to put all this power into it to get it to over, to get it back to a unity state. We have to put all this power to get the over unity thing happening. Um, if we understand resonance, we understand that things in nature aren't balanced. We don't no straight lines, no circles. Once you have balance, it's dead. Um, when you have equilibrium, resonant equilibrium, I found that none of these. Uh, that looks symmetrical, but that's not symmetrical. If everything, we hear a lot about the mathematics and the symmetry and the asymmetry of mathematics. Um, it's symmetrical, but there's nothing symmetrical about it whatsoever. Jimi Hendrix, Jerry Garcia. Now we're starting to, now we're using Arduino, RGB lights. These are the new light rings that give me numbers. Five, eight, 13. Uh, now in, in the, that's one blue color, one blue light in there. Again, I wish that was a better quality on the screen, but now we're changing the numbers in the lights. Now I can relate the frequency I'm putting into the water into five and eight and 13, and I can study the, sh I can study the numbers in mathematics in water this way. This is cymatics filled with Harry Oldfield's polyphasic, poly PIP, PIP system polyphase interference photography, like Curlian photography on steroids, where we're actually looking at the energy, the energetic field of what's happening in the water when we expose it to different resonance. These are some of the images off the new high-res cameras. And they're much clearer and they're much crisper. And when we zoom in, we really have 
uh, a thousand times the information that I had with the cameras that I had two, three years ago. And when I look into these, I see the flux capacitor, I see the field and flow, I see the, the uh, I see what we're looking for in developing new energy systems and developing new technologies. Uh, the shapes are here. I'm finding the shapes in cymatics. I really want to get it out to people uh, to put it into their heads that this is what the new, uh, this is what cars should look like. This is what our de destined chairs should look like. If we want to be comfortable in nature, we should pay attention to resonant structure that, that nature is telling us already. If I could, I'd just do this all day with people. I'd shut up and just go like this and look at it, you know. There's the eight. And uh, there's the vesica. That's my MXR Distortion Plus guitar pedal. And that's, you know, uh, multi-dimensional, omni-dimensional sound propagating mid-range. This is high frequency. This is what happens when you zoom in on high frequency. It's all fractalating. Mathematics, science, technology, the fractal nature of things is very powerful. Looks like fish scales. Donald Duck in the middle of that one. Sometimes I see the craziest things looking out at me. Another good eight. This is 22.5 cycles, I remember it. This is looking at being able to control the spin of them. I'm really interested in the spin. I'm really interested in the vortex. I'm really interested in the toroid. I've been making artwork, compositing. That's our contact information. I'm going to be here uh, today and all day tomorrow. I'll be here Monday, too, if anybody has any questions about sound. If anybody has any questions now, I think we have a few minutes to answer a few questions. Yeah. That'd be great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Microphone, and we'll have a little time to have questions, and you'll have answers. <laughs> So uh, you mentioned that you had done dolphin research. Yes. And I was wondering if you could use this technology to decipher animal language? Yes. Actually, uh, there's a scope here in the Explorer Museum in Albuquerque. And when I set it up several years ago, uh, the buttons on the top of the scope had an uh, uh, owl and a coyote and five different animals all around. So you could go around and push the buttons and watch the sand in the middle change to the shape of different animal sounds. And John Reed, my partner John Reed in this, uh, is very interested in applying uh, meaning to the cymatic. Saying that a cymatic image is 20 cycles, that's interesting, kind of. But to see the, the voice of a lion, to see the voice of the dolphin in particular, is, and whales, is just, just really amazing. So yes, uh, all kinds of uh, animal images. And on the Cymoscope website, you'll see a lot of that. OK. My second question is, I just graduated with my degree in biochemistry, and I was wondering if you were hiring. If I'm hiring? Yes. Sure. Yeah, come on along. <laughs> we can use all the help we can get. Actually, we've got a really great team of people that this work is not a result of my individual effort. It's a result of a whole bunch of people that have come in with different ideas. And, and I invite them over the house, and we sit there for two days and do it. So uh, I'd be happy to, to help you in any way I could. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Um, hi, Eric. Uh, hi. My name is Josh Gulich. Uh, namaste. Namaste. Um, first off, I, I wanted to, to really thank you for your, your passion for precision. I, I really appreciate that. I also wanted to share a little bit I, that, uh, of my work that I think that will really interest you. Mm -hmm. What I've been able to do, I've, I've taken, I've recreated the periodic table Oh, somebody told me about you. I want to talk to you. And yeah. you brought it down, exactly. and we can look at it. Yeah, let's look at that. What I've done is I've taken the, the periodic table, the spectrophonic data yep. um, from the electron transitions, you know, which basically the light frequencies that, yes. that each atom you know, emits, each element emits, mm -hmm. including the intensity data, and downshifted it 40 octaves Yes. Um, and recreated sounds from that for each element. Wow. And 
What, what frequency range are you in? Um, basically, uh, you know, just, um, well, it depends upon each element. I mean, you're bringing um, it down to 500 cycles, 200, down to 20, how far down are you um, optimizing? I think the titanium has the lowest um, sound that, it has a real deep thumb, thrum. Yeah, neat. Um, but but it, it goes up, um, you know, into, you know, um, like 15, 1,500 uh, cycles. So yeah. 1,500 and below. Yeah. Yeah, it's a real good range for the scope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, I think it might be a I go up to a, about 2,500 cycles with the, with the big scope. Yeah, I'll be able to do, uh, you know, 3D uh, auto, uh, what I want to do is be able to do 3D modeling of, um, of you know, uh, actual um, molecules yes. and uh, bondings and nuclear events, yeah. which, which is really something that should be interesting. My question is, do you, do you think that, that your, um, that the semantics technology is actually representational of um, the structure of the, the sound that created it? Yes and no. <laughs> you know, uh, we, we've scratched the surface of cymatics. We've just got devices that lock down the basic, the basic uh, essentials of what you need to see sound. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the system, the whole system, I'm looking at the amplifier, I'm looking at the cables, I'm looking at the electricity coming through the wall, I'm looking at the, in the type of water I'm using, mm -hmm. I'm looking at me thinking, oh, this is going to work like crap today. <laughs> you know what I mean? All yeah. that stuff. But it's one of the only ways to really get shape out of resonance uh, in a form that you can go back to and study. So we, we would need to do research in the right amount of water, the right cup shape for that frequency. Mm -hmm. um, but we could, once you start to get repeated images off of your, your research, then you'll yeah. start to see things. It takes some work, but yes, we can do yeah. it. For example, like, you know, if you bang on a wooden table, you get a frequency signature from that. Yeah. I wonder if that would convert you know, with your system into, you know, like, like an image of a table. The, the information well, here, here from again, the dolphin here again, thing sounded again, When you hit a table, you yeah. do everything but frequency. You create a big resonance structure like that, that you're going to look at the excursion of that, and it's going to uh, have to do with what you hit it with, how hard you hit it, the table, all that. There's a lot of parameters. We'll talk more. Yes, that'd be great. I look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Well, I had the misfortune of coming in just a few moments late on your um, presentation. Really enjoyed it a lot. But I was wondering if you were aware of or had mentioned in any, anywhere about the, uh, the Rosslyn Motet? Yes, actually, uh, we were the first ones to work with Stuart Mitchell uh, years ago when he first started doing that. So the Rosslyn Motet is uh, a, a motet that was taken by Stuart Mitchell. There's, there's cymatic uh, cubes. There's all kinds of stuff in the Rosalind Chapel. The Rosalind Chapel is actually the pinnacle of sort of the, uh, the Knights Templar and the, the Phi. The whole Phi thing was wrapped up by the church. It wasn't until they couldn't build churches that they were on a trip that whoever had the tallest church was right. And, and the flying buttresses went out through the whole town, right? Um, the, the Phi proportion, uh, once they started integrating that into the architecture, which they went around the world. They went to the pyramids, and they went to South America, and they went to China. And the phi proportion directly relates us to nature, and they didn't want that. So they actually squashed the whole thing, put it, they actually put it out with the, uh, with the masons to start to redesign. Now the, all the cathedral, that's all phi proportion. And when you think about a cathedral like the Rosalind, you got, very powerful light color sound healing. You've got, a, you've got big, huge cathedrals that had no amplifiers and microphones, and yet all these people could hear the person at the, at the podium speak. Um, so uh, on the website, you'll see, uh, two, I think, two or three pages where we've done a lot of the Rosalind Motet in water. Uh, I can show you some of that. Actually, uh, after this and today, I'm going to hang out in the, in the downstairs. I'll bring my computer down. And if you want to see some of this stuff high res, it's 100 times better than what you just saw on the screen here. When you can really see it on an HD screen, I'd be happy to show anybody. I can show you the Rosalind Montet stuff. I'd like to see yeah. that. Thank you. C certainly. Hi. Hi. Uh, what I'd like to ask you is, uh, Tesla noticed uh, normal pulsa pulsation of the Earth. Did you catch? Uh, capture, capture the dead kind of sound? Or yeah, is actually, one of, the, one of the most 
uh, popular things that we've looked at is the Schumann resonance uh, in the seven to eight cycle range, real down low. The, the Earth, just like the star videos that I was showing you in initially, uh, in the universe, you know, we've been sold, uh, uh, we've been sold this idea that things orbit. Nothing orbits. Nothing goes around another thing in a straight circle like that. Everything's vorbiting through space like that. And as it vorbits through space, it's not only making a resonant signature in, in space, but it's, it's actually emitting sounds. And the sound of the Earth uh, is obviously unique enough to have uh, all this uniqueness and all this creativity. And, and I think the sound that the Earth puts out, the Schumann resonance, uh, is actually the... Uh, the battery that's keeping us all going. So how that look like? I can it, show you some images uh, of Schumann resonance stuff. We've done a lot with it. it, it, it uh, it's, it's very coherent, very beautiful. You've got to understand, too, the Schumann resonance, the phi proportion, the Schumann resonance, all these things, they're resonant. They move around relative. You can't say it's one particular frequency, eight point, you know, one, two, three cycles like that. Um, so there's a lot of different images off it, but it's definitely very potent in the water. It's not hard at all to uh, move water uh, with, the, with the natural sound of the so earth. So earth pulsation is uh, uh, very good for the human body or animal body or plants. Yes. Uh, so do you have such things which can be produced in form of the play or in form of the sound so we can have in houses? Yes. Um, I'd be happy to show you uh, some of the stuff we've done with Schumann resonance um, and the difference between, uh, and actually, the Schumann resonance in the center of the Earth, everything is a resonance structure. So if you're in Vermont and you're living on granite, and, or if you're in the Sahara Desert and you're living on sand, um, that sound's coming out through the Earth, through the core, through uh, the environment. Everything is a resonant topology. So it's actually different as you go around, just as the, uh, the electromagnetic field is. Okay. So it's not easy to measure as one thing. You need to look at it as a whole resonant propagation around the whole Earth that needs to be studied. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I'm going to have to beg a little grace here. Our time uh, for on the DVD and uh, on the record is come to, uh, we, we need to actually dismiss so that those who want to go get lunch can get lunch. But we're going to continue the Q&A session informally. Yes. Uh, because it looks like we may have a teeny bit of interest over here. <laughs> so um, uh, with that, uh, what I'd like to say is, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Eric Larson, a warm round of applause. Thank, Thank you, you very Thank you. much.